Well, um, today we're going to talk about uh, the case of People versus Brock Allen Turner, the uh, sexual assault um, trial that's happening in Palo Alto. And Elena, you were just at the trial this morning, so I think this is uh, like the closest we've gotten so far <laughs> to breaking news coverage. Um, we'll get the update from you on what happened this morning, where we're at in the uh, whole trial process, and what's to come. Mm -hmm. um, quick synopsis of um, why they're having a trial and what the, the facts and circumstances were. Sure. So last uh, January, in January 2015, um, a Stanford freshman was arrested um, after two grad students um, biking by outside of a fraternity house, saw him on top of a woman, noticed that this woman was not moving, looked totally unresponsive, mm -hmm. and basically intervened. Um, and he was, at the time, charged with, he was suspected of rape. Um, the charges have since been dropped, and he's now facing three felony charges. Um, intent to rape an intoxicated person, sexual assault of an intoxicated person, and sexual assault of an unconscious person. Mm -hmm. um, and he quickly made bail and withdrew from Stanford very quickly voluntarily before they could expel him, I assume. Um, so yeah, so now we're 14 months after right. that incident and that arrest. Mm -hmm. And the trial's been going on since, well, selection started on Monday, March 14th for the jury. Last Monday, right. jury selection. It's right in this Palo Alto Courthouse on Grant Avenue mm -hmm. right by our office, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so they did jury selection for three days through Wednesday. Um, and we were just talking about that, working through um, people's perceptions of law enforcement, if they knew anything about the case itself, if they had read news reports about it. Um, if they were parents, if they had children close in age to either Turner or the alleged victim, and if they thought that they might sympathize, stuff about alcohol use, bias, um, just trying to probe you know, whether or not they would go into it with certain pre preconceptions about the case or about the details. And they went through quite a number of prospective jurors in order to settle on the um, 12 plus two alternates? They did. I mean, I think there's 70 or so people there at the very beginning. The entire courtroom was full, um, mm -hmm. and they worked through to a final... 12 with two alternates, and out of the 12, there's four women and eight men. Okay. Well, uh, give us the, an idea of, like, the age range, um, the, you know, are there college student-aged um, jurors there? Are they mostly older? Mostly um, older. I don't know the specific ages. Um, there are two younger men, mm -hmm. um, but certainly not college age. Mm -hmm. um, the four women are all older. Um, yeah, so... Uh, uh, I would say it skews on the older side, but the, I'm sure there's a big range. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the kind of main strategies um, and the, the arguments that are coming up. A lot of this trial has had to do with intoxication, mm -hmm. um, the ability to um, give consent or not give consent, um, or the inability to give consent um, while drunken, um, how much cognition people have. Yeah. And I think both the prosecution and defense are trying to use these this factor um, as kind of central to their um, their arguments. What have we seen so far from the prosecution? Uh, so, I mean, central to that is that the alleged victim, who I should say is not a Stanford student, she was a recent college graduate at the time, um, does not remember anything that happened. She says that she, she's testified that she doesn't remember. Her last memory is standing outside the frat house with um, some friends and a group of guys she doesn't remember if any of those guys was Turner, but other friends who were with her identified one of them to be him. Mm -hmm. um, and she was drinking a beer. And then the next thing she knew, she woke up in the hospital in San Jose and had lost all memory of the night. Mm -hmm. um, so other expert witnesses who um, know about alcohol and its effects have testified that she probably blacked out, which means that she lost her short-term short memory of that night. Mm -hmm. um, the defense has challenged that, saying just because you lose your memory doesn't mean that while you're out doing whatever you're doing, that meant that you weren't making voluntary decisions. Um, so an expert witness for the defense has, you said that when you're blackout drunk, um, you can still be walking, talking, making, looking normal to the outside world even mm -hmm. while your brain is not recording memories of it. So mm -hmm. you can still be making decisions and they're arguing, consenting to, to what happened between them. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Because so often when we think about, you know, how drunk is, is too drunk, right. um, we think about people pretty much, you know, passed out or right. unconscious. But. Yeah. But wasn't there some testimony as well from uh, from the victim's boyfriend or the alleged victim's boyfriend about her really not seeming? She wasn't. She was pretty out of it. At one yeah. Point? So they played in court a voicemail that she left him that night around twelve fifteen a.m. 
Um, and she's not only slurring, but completely incoherent. I mean, you can make out, barely make out a few words and she's kind of giggling. She's clearly incredibly intoxicated. Mm -hmm. He said he had never heard her like that before. Um, and Turner said that they met and started dancing and kissing around 12.30. So apparently, and he said that she was responsive, communicating normally. So there's this contrast between, mm -hmm. I mean, not only that voicemail, but also um, she was found completely unresponsive and witnesses from the first police officer on the scene to the paramedic who treated her um, to the people in the hospital who said that she was unconscious for hours and, mm -hmm. you know, only she snored a few times. I think she opened her eyes once when someone pinched her fingernails mm -hmm. um, compared to Turner's account that she was, by all accounts, normal, drunk, but communicating normally and responding to everything that he was doing with her. Yeah. What did the um, toxicologist say uh, was uh, his blood alcohol level and hers um, about the time of the assault? I should have written it down. Assault. Hers was higher. Um, and they, so. the, the prosecution had this uh, woman who supervises the county's toxicology unit um, to back extrapolate knowing their height and weight and about how many drinks they had had from their blood alcohol content taken hours later that morning when their blood was drawn back to the time about the alleged assault would have occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and the alleged victims was around either 2.49 was one number, okay. which is compared to, you know, the leading legal driving limit is 0.08, so three, three times, times that. Sure. Um, and Turner's was, I believe it was 0.17 or something. It was it was still above the legal driving limit, but lower than hers. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a lot of discussion also about at what BAC level does someone black out, pass out, fall asleep. And while there's sort of yeah. research around, maybe it happens around certain points, um, it is so variable from person to person depending on your genetic makeup if you're an experienced drinker, your tolerance to alcohol, what you ate that night, if you're, you know, got a lot of sleep the night before. So there's really no way to predict whether, you know, when she passed 0.2, she definitely would have been blacked out or not. Right. There's no way of saying. Right. Every, for everyone, it's different. And for yeah. um, even the blackout point threshold yeah. might yeah. be different. Uh, so there was uh, also discussion about drugs, um, whether or not either person had taken any. Mm -hmm. um, and what tests had been done. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit about that. So the, the county yeah. toxicology unit apparently only tests for certain drugs, and they also do mostly focus on DUIs, mm -hmm. um, which was a point that the defense sort of drove home, that they're not typically testifying in, in sexual assault cases like this. But okay. um, So drugs like cocaine, marijuana, PCP, um, not... Uh, Roofies, but they. You'll have to explain what roofies are. Yeah. Right. So roofies, <laughs> would be, I forget what the. It's, I, I don't know how to pronounce the real like like name. or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a date rape drug, so that someone, you know, the idea of someone slipping something in someone else's drink and then they get so intoxicated that they pass out and can be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, so the county's toxicology unit does not test for that. I don't. I'm not sure why that wasn't explained. Um, but they contract with a private lab that does test for that, and they tested her blood for that, and it came back negative. Okay. All right. Um, there's some interesting um, witness testimonies um, that have come out. The graduate students, mm -hmm. uh, in particular, um, gave one account of what had happened that night, and then um, Turner himself testified. Uh, what was the interaction and what are the two different perspectives on that? Because I think that's mm -hmm. pretty interesting. Yeah, so our, there are discrepancies between those two accounts. Um, the two graduate students um, both have testified that they were on their way to the f same fraternity party mm -hmm. on their bikes. They noticed a couple hooking up on the ground, didn't think much of it. As they got closer, it looked strange. They decided that they needed to do something about it. Um, they got off their bikes and were approaching and one of them called out and said, you know, something along the lines of what's going on, is everything okay? Said something again. Um, Turner responded, this is what the grad students say, looked up back at them, got up off of her, backed away, and then started to run away. Mm -hmm. um, at which point one of the students followed him and eventually tackled him and sort of detained him until the police came. Turner has said that he was with the girl um, and he started to feel sick, so they stopped kissing. Um, they were already on the ground. They were on the ground mm -hmm. out by this dumpster behind the fraternity house. Mm -hmm. um, and he said something to her like, I'm going to throw up. She responded, said, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. He testified. Mm -hmm. um, and he sort of started to get up and backed down this incline. 
And then all of a sudden, there was a guy sitting next to him. Um, a guy put his hand on his shoulder and said something like, you know, what's going on? Um, and then tried to put Turner in a, an arm lock, so sort of, you know, putting his, his arm around his head. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Actually, he testified he was putting, putting his arms around, behind his back, I'm sorry, but it's basically restraining him. Okay. So Turner got scared. Mm -hmm. um, they were getting physical with him, so then he decided to run away because he was fearful of these two guys. And he had no idea why they were intervening or what was going on yeah wasn't it too the that at least one of the one of these students one of the grad students had actually said something like what the bleep are you know are you doing she she's unconscious and yeah. actually said the word unconscious to that him. was another point of contention um mm -hmm. he's testified multiple times that he said that um but the turner's defense attorney asked him why he didn't tell police that that night, and he mm -hmm. said that he didn't, but he described that she had been unconscious, unconscious and responsive. Mm -hmm. um, but that was this sort of dramatic statement the, mm -hmm. the deputy district attorney used as, as the entry into her opening statement. Mm -hmm. um, when Turner was um, actually being uh, interviewed by the police or um, even during the, during the trial, when he took the stand, did he say at all, or did anybody ask him about what kind of behaviors did um, Emily Doe, in this case the, the, vic the alleged victim, th what did she do in terms of being responsive to him sexually? Um, you know, he said that she was, con I believe he said that she was conscious throughout yeah. the entire um, encounter, and so that really is in contrast, but did they bring that up at all? Like, did she kiss you back, yeah. you, know, yes. um, you know, any of those yeah. types of things? Yeah, and he gave a pretty detailed blow by blow, which is the first account of um, I mean, it's from his point of view, but what had happened between them, these hours between, you know, it's sort of this, it's a really short span of time between about 12.30 and 1 a.m. when mm -hmm. all of this happened. Um, yeah, he said that he saw her dancing by herself. He asked if he could dance with her. She said yes. They started kissing. He asked if she wanted to go back to his dorm. She said sure. Um, they were walking outside and holding hands, and she sort of lost her balance and fell down because they were holding hands, pulled him with her. Then they started kissing on the ground. He asked if he could, um, it's kind of graphic, digitally mm -hmm. penetrate her, and she said yes, and so he did. Mm -hmm. And she was responding, they were kissing. He said, he said that um, her hands were on his back, so various physical and verbal signs okay. that, that, she he has, awake, he that she has, he testified this week but um, did not give as many details in his police interview, which they played, uh, played in court this morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, um, both the defense and the prosecution are really attacking the credibility yeah, of completely. various testimonies, yeah. um, starting with the prosecution witnesses. So the defense was trying to bring them back to statements they had made earlier and trying to find yeah. discrepancies. Yeah, he did that uh, with almost everyone. Um, there was a preliminary hearing in October, mm -hmm. so he, you know, he read direct transcripts of testimony that they gave them, trying to really drill down on, well, you said this in October. Is that true? Is that not true? Yeah. Do you want to change your testimony? Um, yeah. Does he appear to be succeeding in, in rattling um, the witnesses or getting them to confirm that they didn't say something or that they're saying something different? Um, now? It, it sort of varied. I mean, some of the details that didn't seem that important that he was trying to pin them down on. One of them, though, was that her younger sister, who was with her that night, had previously testified that she seemed, quote, fine mm -hmm. before her sister left to take another friend home who was too drunk. Mm -hmm. um, and so he really pushed her on what she meant by fine. Mm -hmm. And I think he was trying to get at, well, um, I mean, everyone was trying to, the difference, both sides were trying to establish was she too drunk or was she right, fine? Their their version so, of that. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, that was one. And he also made a really you know strong point about the what the bleep are you doing? She's unconscious. If that had ever been said or not. Yeah, yeah. So, um, the prosecution um, was. Now we've had a couple of defense witnesses, not as many as yeah. the prosecution had called, but the first one was an expert uh, in. Um, psychology and uh, yeah, she's behaviors. a clinical psychology professor yeah. at UT Austin who's done extensive research on alcohol and its effects on memory and cognition particularly on young adults she mm -hmm. I mean she's clearly a qualified witness she's in the midst of a longitudinal study of college students at UT Austin and you know 2400 students who over the course of 10 years have recorded their drinking habits and risk-taking behaviors and that they're studying in her lab um, so, and she was the one who said, you know, someone who is blackout drunk can still make voluntary decisions and IE could still consent. Mm -hmm. um, but the prosecution really vigorously mm 
-hmm. challenged her credibility by um, asking her, how much are you paid to be here? Which was, Mm -hmm. she already received an $8,000 retainer. Um, They'll refund her for her airfare and hotel stay, obviously. Mm -hmm. And she said she makes about $10,000 on average for testifying. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are also this this set of emails that the prosecuting DA read between this witness and Mike Armstrong, who's Turner's attorney, Mm -hmm. before the case. um, And she multiple times talked about, you know, I just returned from this trial, she said, in one where the guy had admitted to raping a woman. There was a, quote, huge acquittal. Um, So sort of... The, the deputy, D, deputy DA was trying to show that she was, you know, not coming to this unbiased. Um, right. But right. She, I think in that email she had said something like, let's hope the same thing will happen. Yeah, yeah. let's hope yeah. for a comparable yes. outcome for your client. Um, uh, and the defense's response was that she gets paid no matter what the outcome of it is and no matter what she says during her testimony. Right. She was associated with another trial that was um, fairly high profile. Yeah, she right? testified uh, a few years ago. It was a Steubenville, Ohio rape trial, which was a nationally known case. Um, mm-hmm. it was two, I think it was two football, high school football students who uh, had sexually assaulted and a young woman and videotaped the whole thing. And mm-hmm. I think the video got out. Um, mm-hmm. They were eventually found guilty, mm-hmm. um, but they were minors. So it was okay. a different case. But she gave, it was almost, I mean, I read a news article about it and she gave mm-hmm. very, very similar testimony, the exact same quote about mm-hmm. someone who was blackout can make, quote, voluntary, voluntary decisions. decisions. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, this morning, then, um, mm-hmm. there were some character witnesses, and um, can you tell us a little bit about just kind of the mood in the courtroom, um, Turner's reactions? Mm-hmm. Um, these are people who are standing up for him um, and testifying to his character. Yeah, so his um, a friend who he's known since middle school, who he was on the swim team with, and he was, he was an all-star swimmer. Um, and it sounds like he was probably recruited at Stanford. I'm not mm-hmm. sure, but he, he made some comment about that. But... Um, so a friend he had grown up with in Ohio and swam with, his high school girlfriend and his swim coach all testified this morning. Um, and Turner's been pretty, I, I don't want to say stoic, sort of un, unreacting to the witness testimony besides looking kind of nervous. And he clearly, he got emotional today for the first time. Um, he started crying outside the courtroom during a break um, for the first time. And they all testified, you know, their relationships with him. They had known him for a long time. They, he was a dedicated swimmer, um, respectful boyfriend. Um, but the prosecution asked each of them, have you ever seen him drunk? Have you ever gone to a party with him? Have you ever seen him intoxicated? And none of them ever had. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was her point. Those, those were basically the only questions she asked them. Did okay. they bring in character witnesses for, um, for, J- uh, for uh, I want to say Jane Doe, for Emily Doe? No, they didn't. Um, no. I mean, they had her younger sister and um, a friend who were there that night, but it, it, not not as character witnesses, mm-hmm. no. I'm curious if the whole topic of um, being blackout drunk um, is something that's frequently discussed in college campuses if younger people are talking about, oh, is this, you know, the levels of drunkenness and, oh, is there the ability to consent at a certain point. I mean, is, is there chatter about that? Is there is, is that a hot topic among people who are... I don't know that it's talked about in terms of, you know, can you give consent or not? I think it's, mm-hmm. you know, I went to, I think the average college student wouldn't be so, well, I, I mean, I can't generalize, but it's, I think it's normal for some people to black out and it's sort of a part, a fact of life in, if mm-hmm. you're partying in college. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know that it's talked about in terms of, you know, if, if you're sexually assaulted or if you engage in mm-hmm. sexual contact with someone while you're blackout, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think until it happens to someone, it's also hard to yeah. to know how you feel about it. Yeah. One thing that I was noticing um, just in terms of the timeline of events was that um, somehow the two of them, Doe and Turner, did leave the party together. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not been in any way uh, implied or suggested that he dragged her out. No. So we we're to assume that she walked out somehow, stumbled out, what have you. Yeah, I mean, he said that they mm-hmm. walked out together after he said, you want to go back to my dorm? Yeah. Um, but they really weren't that far from the mm-hmm. frat house. They've showed photos from the vantage point of a back patio of the Cap Alpha fraternity house. And mm-hmm. I mean, if you were there, you probably wouldn't notice anyone where they were, but it was within, mm-hmm. you know, um, viewing distance um, mm-hmm. where they 
were found. Mm -hmm. Did she say at what point, uh, at what point, was it clear at what point she might have blacked out? Where, she, where did she lose her memory in this whole timeline? Her last memory is standing on that back patio with a group of people. Sounds like he was one of those people and she was just talking with them. So mm -hmm. um, he said sometime soon after that, he saw her dancing by herself and he approached her. Um, but she doesn't remember that. And no one else has testified to seeing that happen. Yeah. Given the alcohol levels and um, their bloodstreams, I'm just struck by how how quickly this must have happened, this yeah. incident, because she was able somehow to get outside, probably on her own two feet, and yeah. then all of a sudden they're on the ground. You know, something's happening there, and the graduate students are are seeing it. Um, yeah, I mean, really short span of time, mm -hmm. um, and they had only both. Uh, Doe and Turner separately arrived at the party around 11 o'clock, so it wasn't, mm -hmm. um, it is a pretty short period of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, were there any other um, witnesses or testimonies that um, either surprised you from this trial or just have you know, really stuck in your mind as being fairly um, critical to, um, to the whole trial? Um, it's all been really fascinating. I mean, it's been at times you know, graphic, the, mm. the nurse who did her SART exam at the hospital that morning, which is an exam to collect evidence in the case of a suspected sexual assault, and right. they showed photographs and a lot of mm. um, pretty graphic evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I went back and made a list of all the prosecution's witnesses yesterday and just thinking about how she, she was trying to piece the, the whole evening together for mm -hmm. the jurors was really interesting to think about. And she sort of jumped mm. from, you know, objective, a police officer who obviously didn't know her, who just found her on, responded to seeing her on the ground, to her younger sister, who obviously knows her very well, mm -hmm. um, to the, the hospital nurse, um, to DNA expert, mm -hmm. um, just sort of crafting this whole image of what happened. And yeah. they've also shown a lot of photos of the scene where it happened, mm -hmm. of Doe herself that night, um, photos of it the next morning, to sort of familiarize the jurors with you know, make them feel like they were there and um, what was going on and, and get them to understand it. Yeah. Um, so a little bit about the personalities of the uh, prosecution um, and the defense attorneys then. Um, Kian, Kian Ursi, is mm -hmm. that how you pronounce her name? Yeah. So she actually works with the sexual assault unit. Um, yeah, so she's the deputy DA and she yeah. works with the county's sexual yeah. assault unit. Yeah. What kind of character characteristics does she have? Um, how is she? I would say this? everything has been pretty civil and straightforward until um, she got pretty aggressive with the UT professor talking really? about, you know, her payment and those emails. Mm -hmm. um, and then also with Turner, obviously, she was pretty, I mean, she asked some pointed questions. Um, Mike Armstrong, who's his attorney, has not been as aggressive, I would say. Um, but, yeah. Trying try to elicit the points, but yes. not yeah. people's Different styles. Spaces. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so Monday, uh, tell us what's going to happen next, because we're almost at the end of the um, presentations for both the cases. Mm -hmm. So there's one defense witness left, unclear mm -hmm. who that is, um, and he or she is set to testify on Monday, mm -hmm. and then closing arguments are expected on Monday as well, so then the jury will deliberate for however long, um, mm -hmm. return a verdict. Yeah, so we're almost at the end here. Yeah. Was, was there any um, indication, I'm sorry, um, okay. in this this whole trial that there might have been any kind of coercion of, of information like drawn out from by the police officer of um, information from Turner or anything like that at the time? I don't think so. I mean, they played his whole interview this morning and they made sure it also, they played a video of when the investigating officer read Turner his Miranda rights and he agrees to everything and um, mm -hmm. is communicating and understands what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, Was there any sense uh, when you looked at, the, at that video of him or heard any audio that he was drunk at the time, when they brought, or how drunk he might have been when they brought him in? He, he, I mean, I, he, he sounded normal. He wasn't slurring his words, um, and he himself, I mean, he, at different times in the interview, said, you know, yeah, I was really, really drunk, but I remember everything, but parts are fuzzy, but I remember this, this, and this. Um, and he, he testified, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the drunkest he's ever been, he was a 7. At the time they interviewed him, this was uh, some six hours later. Yeah, uh, I think it was around 6.30 a.m. that morning. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're going to wrap up. Um, well, we're going to wrap up the trial next week, and we're going to wrap up the webcast now. <laughs> um, so we'll see, um, see what happens and how quickly the jury can come to a decision if they can. Yeah.
Um, so, all right. Well, thanks for the uh, discussion today, and we'll, we'll find out next week. Um, you can always uh, catch the latest news on paloaltoonline.com. If you want to talk about this, it's paloaltoonline.com slash square for town square. I'll see you next week. Thank you.